good morning and welcome to the one day seminar that we are having um, to sort of replace what we had originally planned for almost a year ago. Uh, about, uh, it, about almost a year ago, that is in Mar March of uh, 2020, uh, this year that seems to have vanished off all our calendars, uh, we had planned, uh, we being Naveen and I, uh, had planned a, a one day, two day seminar on the co-shaping of science, technology and society, uh, mainly uh, trying to address the question of how should uh, social sciences be taught within a science and technology curriculum. This was, as, uh, as you know, quite a while before the new education policy had been announced and imposed on all of us, uh, when this whole idea of interdisciplinarity was uh, there, you know, present in all our uh, consciousness and in our pedagogic traditions, but we had not, uh, it had not been formulated for us in the way in which it has come about in the NEP. Uh, our motivation was from a slightly different point of view, uh, which is the following. Uh, over the last 10, uh, over the last several decades, uh, there have been many institutes that have been highly specialized in the areas of science and technology. Uh, the IITs, of course, are a prime example. Uh, then, um, you know, after the IITs came this whole set of NITs or uh, simultaneously the NITs uh, and then the triple ITs, uh, which were largely given over to information technology. And then uh, about 20 years ago, uh, the idea of having pure science institutes like the IISERs, uh, and the related institutes like the NICR and the CSB and so on and so forth. So uh, in short, in India now we are seeing something like about anywhere from 50 to 100 institutions that are either pure science or pure technology. And in all these institutions, we have a humanities department and all these curriculums include uh, some amount of mandated humanities courses. Uh, and this has been the tradition for a while. Uh, I myself studied at the IIT Kanpur, uh, you know, about 50 years ago when, uh, when the IIT Kanpur was started, it had a very strong and vibrant humanities department to which many of you would know uh, at least the traditions <coughs> of, right. Uh, but, Increasingly, we have not been very clear as to how the social sciences should integrate with the uh, science and technology uh, uh, curriculum and the education. And this is a question that Naveen and I have been uh, discussing informally uh, for about two years now. And then we decided that the best way to try to find an answer would be to have a seminar where many of you who can, uh, who have thought about these questions and who can think more deeply about these questions uh, would be able to contribute. And, and we could come up with some kind of a plan uh, of how, how to properly integrate all these various strands of education. Because we do believe, uh, you know, just as teachers, that uh, a multiplicity of disciplines and, uh, and, uh, and uh, different ways of thinking are important, uh, important for all of us in, in so, so many ways that uh, one cannot even quantify easily. So now the, the original workshop was to have been sponsored uh, by the Indian Academy of Sciences in their program uh, for, uh, the, they, they do have two day workshops in a variety of different subjects, but this was a new one. And uh, so this was to have been done uh, under the aegis of the Indian Academy of Sciences Bangalore. Uh, well, that was not to happen. Uh, so we've actually now just gone into a different mode. Uh, Madhu, if you could just switch on to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> in March of last year, we had planned a five session uh, program over, spread out over two days. And uh, this uh, had uh, the four uh, technical sessions with the sort of the, the titles are given out over there. 
uh, and there was, there was about, you know somewhere about 16 speakers. There was the there was a fifth session which was just uh, one speaker, a uh, special invited uh, talk. But anyhow, all that is now just that much history. Uh, what we thought we would do is to resurrect the idea of this uh, seminar by having at least uh, having more than one day long seminar like we are doing today. All right, uh, so I'm not going to announce when the next ones will be because it will depend largely on uh, imponderables, um, like as when people are going to you know, submit papers and so on and so forth. But what we have done today is to look at uh, the, the technical session number three, cultivating amateur curiosity across disciplinary boundaries um, and sort of morphed it into uh, today's uh, webinar seminar, what have you, which I'm now going to uh, hand over to Naveen to take the discussion forward from here uh, in fleshing out what we plan to do today and to introduce all of you all. Naveen. Good morning, all. It's, it's a great pleasure for all of us uh, uh, to get together, even if it's uh, uh, in the virtual mode for us. And uh, um, I don't want to uh, 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 drag the introduction on for too long. Quickly, we have uh, four papers uh, 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 written up in a particular way, and we want to uh, do a sort of a mini workshop sort of a thing to discuss these four in a particular format. And uh, 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 we are joined by uh, our four panelists for this uh, first session today. Uh, uh, two of them are paper writers, and uh, two are discussing it. Uh, uh, they are uh, Vasundara Bojwe from uh, SNU, uh, uh, Dhruv Raina from JNU, Majmita Mazunda from uh, DAICIICT. Yes, I got it right. And uh, uh, V. Sanil from IIT. Yeah, so um, uh, the papers which we are reading in this session today are titled um, uh, STS in a Tech Curriculum The Trouble Career of Strong Integration by Madhumita and uh, Sociology of uh, League as Science in the Classroom by Vasim. Yeah, so, and uh, um, if I could take the liberty of uh, uh, describing the uh, uh, panelists in a quick way, Madhumita Mazumdar is a professor of history at uh, D A I I C T, uh, uh, which is the Dhirubhai Ambani uh, Institute of Information and Communication Technology, Gandhinagar. Uh, while focusing on social and cultural history of technology and science, she uh, 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 weaves her broader interest in history of modernity and development practice in colonial and post colonial India in her inquiries and teaching. She has taught STS in D A I I C T for more than a decade and a half. And her publications include a collaboration on new histories of the Andamans, Landscape, Place, and Identity. Uh, it's a CUP publication. Uh, and uh, also uh, 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 thinking about the making of a new colonial masculinity in Bengal in an edited volume. There are uh, many others, but I thought these two caught the eye straight away. Uh, v. Sanel is uh, 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 formerly a professor of philosophy at IIT Delhi, though I'm not sure he likes being called one. Uh, he has taught uh, technology and humanities students at IIT for well over two decades uh, with his breadth of uh, interest in ontology, aesthetics, and episteme, and have uh, recently developed an exciting new course at the interstices of biology and philosophy. Uh, um, it's not entirely sure whether he likes to call it philosophy and biology or biology and philosophy, but uh, definitely this really uh, uh, caught uh, uh, interest of uh, a lot of us and the students here. And, quite an exciting way of, and I think he brings that uh, experience into his paper in a very interesting way today. And uh, uh, Sanil's uh, recent book on Koleyude choreography, or choreography of killing was released last month. And uh, is, uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, 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 widely discussed uh, in the audience. And it's just quite an exciting collection of uh, uh, pieces. Uh, Vasundara Bojwed is an assistant professor at the uh, Department of Sociology at Shilnada University. Her research seeks to understand entities such as air pollution, smoke, and clouds, and how they reconfigure the social worlds, uh, uh, how the making of the social worlds happen through this construction of such entities. And uh, this, uh, she says, is done through an explanation, exploration of the intersections of 
the categories of science, climate change, and ecological relationships. Uh, uh, Vasundara offers uh, uh, a number of courses, including for our interests, sociology of science, and an anthropology of climate change uh, uh, in SNU. Dhruv Raina is a professor of uh, history and philosophy of science at the Zakir Hussain Center for Education Center, uh, studies at JNU. He was uh, a fellow at various prestigious institutes across the world, including the Wissenschaft College uh, Zoo Berlin. And uh, Dhruv has written extensively on social epistemology, historiography of mathematical proof, uh, and have guided a good number of scholars uh, who are broadly working in various allied areas, including social history of knowledge and higher education in modern India. So um, I think uh, uh, it would be safe to say we have uh, a very focused and uh, 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 interested and in eminent talent here uh, to discuss uh, the two papers uh, on offer, and which unfortunately is yet not gone public in the next couple of months. The hope is that it will be published. Um, this is the uh, 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 sh uh, schedule we have proposed. Uh, the two papers will be introduced by uh, someone who has not written it. So the first paper by uh, uh, Madhmita uh, uh, will be introduced by Vasundara Bajwet. And then uh, the second paper, which happens to be Vasundara's paper, would be introduced by V. Sanan. And then there would be a discussion of the two papers by Dhruv Raina, along with the broader discussion by him. And then we have the response from the paper writers, the respective paper writers, after which we'll have half an hour of open session. Yeah, so uh, can I then invite uh, uh, Dr. Bojwe to uh, uh, introduce uh, Madhmita. Yeah. Right. Um, thank you very you much. Have around, uh, 10 minutes? Yeah. Sure, 10 minutes, yeah. Thank you very much, Naveen um, and Ram for organizing this workshop. And uh, I look forward to introducing Dr. Mazumdar's paper. Um, we all know the title of the paper, I'm not going to repeat it. Um, and Dr. Mazumdar is a faculty at the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute of Information Communication Technology, Gandhinagar, Gujarat. Um, her article presents a genealogy of tech humanities curriculum at the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute through interviews with the pioneers of the program, those that have been part of it since its inception up to its current state. Um, so she really gives us a genealogy of the possibility of these of the integration. The intent in doing this is twofold. One, to highlight the genealogy of STS pedagogies in different parts of India. Uh, this will, of course, be in response to Gandhinagar Gujarat. And the second is to draw attention to the deeper structural constraints that define the possibility for integrating the technical and humanities disciplines. Um, and a knowledge of these two points, she states, is essential to allow for more fruitful conversations to allow for stronger integration between the technical sciences and the humanities. Okay, so just to give you a context of where her argument is located, um, she informs us that prior to the Dhirubhai Imbani project being conceived, which was in the early 2000-2001, um, uh, Professor Surud, who was at that, was faculty and and social and liberal arts coordinator at the National Institute of Design in Gujarat was seminal. Um, and this is because in 1995 at NID, um, he had very strongly pushed that there should be an integration of the technology and uh, humanities curriculum as a core part of the design curriculum at NID. And he brought this worldview um, and this emphasis to uh, the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute when it was being conceived and the curriculum being, was being defined. Um, that's the first part uh, point that really gives us the context of the larger argument. The second is that the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute was envisioned as being particularly suited to the socio-cultural context of Gujarat, um, which was very interesting for me to read, uh, which was that the institutions, the academic institutions in Gujarat that were seen as successful were those that imparted practice-oriented curriculum. Um, keeping that in mind, the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute was envisioned as an institute that would also um, impart practice-oriented curriculum. Um, now, also what we see in uh, the ge genealogy presented by Dr. Mazumdar is the important place and roles played by individuals and individual experience. Um, so we've talked about Professor Sarod from um, NID who brought his vision of uh, really integrating 
humanities and technology in the curriculum at the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute. There was also someone named Professor uh, Kudichkar, uh, who had been himself a student at IIT Kanpur and of course enjoyed the humanities and social science courses there, and then later went to the US and brought that experience um, into the vision of the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute, but also throughout the life of the Institute, um, individual academics who came and left the Institute um, who were sociologists, philosophers, and historians of science were all endemic to creating the culture and success of such an integrated program. So this is highlight highlighted throughout her um, article. Um, and uh, to enable interdisciplinarity, um, and as we were told when this uh, panel started, the NEP has only just come out, but at the time that the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute was being set up, uh, there was a strong focus on interdisciplinarity, um, and this was emphasized in the structuring of uh, the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute in such that there were no discipline-based departments. They just had a broad um, body of faculty. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that even though humanities and social science faculty came from their respective disciplinary locations, the courses offered um, would not be discipline-specific. In fact, they would be theme specific and faculty had the freedom to interpret the themes and also come up with their own assessment patterns across the semester and of course the whole year. Um, now keeping these um, things in mind, the courses that were developed were that in the first semester, um, students did a course called Approaches to Indian Society, um, followed by which they would do a course in their next semester called Principles of Economics. It's only in their second year that they do the course Science and Technology Studies, which is then followed by environmental studies. And the STS course was broadly broken up into two sections. The first section had key thinkers and important approaches. And the second section had um, the uh, STS in the Indian context. Um, and we, we are told that as uh, pedagogy started and the curriculum was imparted to the student body, um, there were faculty that came and uh, left. So they brought with them electives um, offered beyond these, beyond these three courses that engaged in science and technology studies, and of course brought their disciplinary locations to um, bringing that to the classroom. Now, towards the end of the uh, article, um, which I thought was really, really illuminating for me, and I, uh, was where Madhumita is very self-reflexive about uh, three things. One is her disciplinary location, Second is how that disciplinary location informs a department. And third, how that in, in, uh, informs how ped pedagogy is meted out by the instructor, which is of course tied to the method of a discipline. And I'll just explain that through uh, Dr. Majumdar's experience. Um, prior to joining the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute, Dr. Majumdar was in the history department in Kolkata University. Um, and she, she does inform us that um, within the curriculum in most conventional history departments in India, let's say if not the world, um, science enters the modern history curriculum. And even when it does in the classroom, it enters the modern history curriculum in sporadic ways. Um, and uh, the sporadicity of it is that it is broadly strung around three themes, modernity, colonization, and nationalism. So what we have in conventional history departments is when science uh, technology studies broadly is imparted in the classroom. It really, the, le the focus is at the macro level um, to do engagement with concepts such as modernity, colonization, and nationalism, um, which means that the fundamental questions and debates of STS and more um, um, ethnographic studies, for example, are often left out in that form formulation of a curriculum. And this is, um, absolutely tied to method in the discipline, which means that for most historians, the um, agreed upon method is based yeah. on archival studies, long archive, longitudinal archival studies. So the kinds of research that gets passed, the kinds of projects that get passed, the kind of pedagogy imparted in these classrooms will engage with long-term archival studies. Now, um, very reflexively, self-reflexively, Dr. Majumdar, um, uh, shares with us in her article that this informed her pedagogy at the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute. Um, so just a quick reminder, there were no department specific uh, uh, faculty 
in the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute. She was a historian, but she was part of the faculty body. So she was supposed to impart interdisciplinary STS um, education in the classroom, but her disciplinary location as a historian uh, absolutely came up in the classroom, right? Um, so uh, intersection questions of intersectional identities, race, class, caste, gender, and ethnographic studies um, did not come to her as easily in, in the initial years in imparting pedagogy to do with STS in the classroom um, because her prior location in the history department and her disciplinary location mostly looked at macro issues, right? Um, and the last part of the uh, article uh, importantly engages with students um, and the kind of students that were in the university at large and in the STS classroom. Um, so as we've mentioned, um, students in the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute came to the STS course after having done approaches to Indian society and principles of economics. However, uh, Dr. Majumdar found that most of these students uh, didn't seem to have um, grasped much from these two courses. So she would often have to really start from um, step one. And that really slowed down classroom instruction for her. And she couldn't dive head on into the important themes and debates of STS uh, that she wanted to bring to her classroom. But among students in the STS course, the most um, exciting part of the course was unit four, which was a group-based field intensive project. And students really enjoyed this um, in the STS course. However, over 10 years, again, due to structural changes, which is what her article really alerts us to, um, the, the integrity of the strong integra integration uh, was, um, going, was suffering because of three structural reasons. One is there was a new quota institute instituted which meant that 50% of the intake into the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute was of students from schools in Gujarat. Um, that's one. The second is there was a radical increase in student intake. So the student teacher ratio in the classroom was really affected badly. And the third was there was departure of key faculty who really championed the cause of integrating the humanities and the technology disciplines. And unfortunately, these three structural changes did, had a negative effect on uh, the possibility of a stronger integration. Um, currently, uh, uh, the Just new- minute, Sorry, two minutes? Yeah, I'm done, last point. Currently, uh, the new curriculum review committee has been constituted at the Guru Bhai Amani Institute. Dr. Majumdar is part of that committee and uh, it's really on her shoulder to carry forth uh, the case of um, uh, pushing for strong integration of the humanities and the technology disciplines. Um, what will happen from, with that, the future of that is all an open-ended question and uh, we don't know right now, right? Um, but with that, I will end the introduction um, of Dr. Majumdar's paper. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwila. Can I now uh, invite Sanan to introduce Majumdar's paper? Huh? I think it's better if you go here. switch this off. Huh? My camera is muted here. I don't think it's no, there, right? No, no, it's not there at all. Uh -huh. Just, just go there. Good morning. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, Ram and uh, Naveen sitting next. It's great to be with human beings and scholars in this, uh, you know, time. It's very exciting and to also see all of you here uh, virtually. And uh, it's a very uh, exciting occasion for, you know, taking up such a detailed reading of uh, uh, these texts. And uh, I am happy to introduce uh, Vasundara's uh, paper, Sociology of As Science in the Classroom. 
and uh, it's a very engaging and challenging and reflexive uh, uh, you know uh, a paper which is on sociology of science and sociology as science and also she speaks from her uh, disciplinary location and hence it is uh, ethnography on the pedagogical practice and uh, pedagogy of ethnography right it has uh, both so it's very tightly uh, reflexive uh, paper which demands uh, careful reading so if i miss something i'm sure uh, vasundara will be able to add while we discuss the uh, uh, paper so the uh, uh, i think this text has three major components one is an account of sociology of science and another is sociology as science and third is uh, pedagogy of uh, sociology of science as science or as art or as uh, craft so these are the three major headings under which uh, uh, you know this engagement is uh, done and uh, you know she starts with an account of uh, a crisis in pedagogy pointed out by uh, jp soberoy and uh, it ends with uh, uh, you know a very decisive response to uh, that that crisis uh, so that's the structure of the uh, argument and it it actually moves through a very rich uh, ethnographical account of almost an auto ethnography of vasundara's on handling the question about uh, you know these uh, forming and teaching this course as a ad hoc faculty in delhi university while she was a phd student and many of us are familiar with vasundara's uh, um, you know work in sociology of uh, science on pollution and uh, so while doing that work she was uh, teaching as an adjunct faculty and later as a faculty in the department of sociology at shivnada where her attempt to formulate uh, and teach these uh, courses it's an ethnographical account and also a re reflexive concept reflexive conceptualization of uh, those uh, experience so in fact uh, when she started uh, you know there was there was an attempt to propose an elective course in uh, sociology of uh, science but uh, it was uh, rejected under the argument that uh, Uh, there are not enough faculty to teach a sociology of science and she asked this question there are many faculty anybody seems can teach sociology of india sociology of caste etc but when it comes to sociology of science there is immediately a demand for a specific uh, um, you know competence so she diagnosed the reason for this hesitation as one is the difficulty of uh, you know doing anything with science uh, because it's an expert domain and the other one is that the the sociological aspect of the study of science is not very engaging for a sociology student or a general faculty uh, but uh, today the sociology of science become the sociology part of it is contentious and that's the root to the uh, question about sociology of uh, science Uh, whereas you know then there was an attempt to start this uh, you know fiup this uh, introductory uh, course on sociology where she notices that the question of science is actually entering in two ways one is part of the typical uh, you know sociological discussion on science and religion and magic that part of it second is that the scientific nature of sociology itself these are the two ways in which Uh, you know there was uh, the possibility of introducing uh, you know this and uh, here when it comes to the uh, you know later when she tried to formulate the sociology of science course in uh, shivnada and you will see the account of a sociology of science course and an anthropology of climate change and in fact uh, you know these these together introduces us to the crux of the problem which she is presenting so she says there is a um there's a predicament of anybody who is trying to offer a course on sociology of science one is that the object domain is already constituted that science that's unified and it is constituted but there are uh, di diverse ways of doing it almost every discipline seems to have there is history of science there is philosophy of science 
there is legal disciplines on uh, science. So there are many disciplines which are going. So object domain is constituted where these disciplines doesn't have a say, whereas the method and the approach, the disciplinary location is uh, uh, changing. So uh, how do we handle uh, this? This is one of the crucial issues about, uh, uh, you know, uh, addressing uh, this uh, question. And she actually identifies around six uh, important features that uh, goes into uh, formulating a course on uh, sociology of science or anthropology of climate change. I think these are very carefully spelt, spelt, out, spelt out, which might help us uh, discussing this problem. Uh, one is that uh, being a sociologist, anthropologist from that disciplinary location, this course needs to have a very rich, there's an emphasis on the ethnographic engagement of this, right? And the, uh, the specific feature of this emphasis, we will come soon. The second is that there is a focus on, as we call modern and contemporary sciences, that is physical sciences and biological uh, sciences. The third is that uh, later these are extended to, uh, other sciences like statistics, mathematics, economics, and finally to sociology. So at the second point, you start with physical and biological sciences, and then there is a possibility of extending it to sociology and ask the question uh, in what way sociology is a science. And then there is the fourth issue is about which authors to include, right? It depends on uh, various faculty members, their specific interests, the nature of the students. And so to think about a set of authors, uh, in, and this list can be tweaked according to these various uh, factors. And the fifth is a very important issue that the absence of philosophy of science uh, in the uh, sociology of science curriculum. And it could be because of one is the stress on ethnography is replacing the need for history and philosophy of science. And this is a crucial point, that is the uh, ethnography, the emphasis on ethnography, which was our first factor, which is actually informing the replacement of history and uh, philosophy of uh, you know, science. And uh, the sixth factor is the exclusion of uh, materials from technology and medicine is partly because these sociology of technology and medicine, they are evolving as separate disciplines in them. So there's enormous amount of literature which cannot be brought into a sociology of science uh, course. So, uh, you know, these are the points around which her own uh, engagement with formulating a course on sociology of science uh, is articulated. Now then here, uh, Vasundara takes up another important problem about the question of decolonization, right? And uh, she quotes JPS again, that the question of decolonization about, and this is the question about, uh, is there an Indian sociology? How does this question reflects on the formulation of a sociology of science uh, course uh, curriculum? And two ways in which this question can be articulated. First is that in some sense, Indian sociology is, uh, uh, colonized by Western ways of approach methods, et cetera. Second is the complaint that there is nothing original in Indian sociology. And uh, she seems to agree with JPS that the real question is the first one that is about the decolonization of uh, Indian sociology. And here, uh, Vasundara introduces some extremely important points. Uh, one is that the question of decolonization uh, doesn't have the same point of engagement as with other disciplines because sociology of science, in some sense, the you don't have the other the the object is all domain is already constituted as uh, um, you know science. So you cannot go and colonize. Instead, the sociology of science is colonized by science. Its object domain. Right? So the sociologist, the one who is the author of this discipline or the investigator cannot have his designs there because it's already, the object domain is constituted, it is unified and it is uh, actually colonizing the inquiry instead of the other way around, right? So this is a point which we, I think I'm sure will come up for 
discussion because the sociologist needs to seek the permission of the scientist even to talk to him. So in what sense then we can think about colonization. This is one. And there's a second response to the question of colonization or decolonization of knowledge that she says that, uh, you know, the sociology of science is today moving towards a decentering the human subject. The subject is no longer the, uh, the focus or the starting, the, the anchoring point of a new sociology. And this is the time, you know, uh, the question about the why as an anthropologist a sociology of science person is thinking about a course on anthropology of climate change, right? So she says the, the question of, is there an Indian sociology is now engaged as, is there an Indian air, right? Is there an Indian earth, right? Is there an Indian air? So it becomes a question about the nature of the uh, object, like metaphysical objects out there. It's a question about reality, not a question about, the other decolonization projects are always asking, is there an Indian way of knowing? But here the question is there as an Indian, uh, you know, reality, which is constituted by this ways of uh, uh, knowledge. So uh, this idea that now there are various earth shaping forces outside the sphere of human influence, when that is brought into this, right, there is a certain way in which as uh, Vasundra says, mute matter can travel globally, right? So this, at the object domain, there is a globalization taking place, which is different from the globalization we have been talking about while reflecting on the question about, uh, you know, globalization or decolonization. So this is the, uh, the way in which the, 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 the rationale behind a sociology of science also taking, uh, transforming itself or invoking the need for an anthropology of uh, uh, climate uh, change. And here the, uh, you know, the, the analysis gets back to the question about uh, uh, pedagogy and uh, the, you know, I'm sure, you know, she says what she uh, encounters the question about uh, pedagogy as a craft. Uh, which is both a science and, uh, uh, you know, uh, art. And where we look at the course formation level, now the crisis is responded to by having these two things and putting the label on the object domain itself. And then she says what she actually does is that uh, she asks when there is a classroom of science, engineering and science students and social science students, she asks the engineering students to explain their own internal theoretical account of their discipline, and then introduce ethnographical practice, you know, accounts which will make sense of these theoretical accounts proposed by science students, and then guest faculty who are uh, in, you know, in mathematics, etc., and who are interested in uh, the history of mathematics, history of economics, etc., to talk to these, uh, uh, you know. Uh, student. And this is the way the question about the social you know, uh, science is brought in. So I will uh, wind up by uh, saying that this is an ethnographical account of an auto ethnographical account of how we talk about this and the specific, uh, you know, nature of the object domain called uh, science and the challenge it is posing to all the questions which we are discussing. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Uh, can I now invite Drew to respond to the two papers again? Uh, uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, yeah, it's nice to see a lot of old friends around and to meet new friends. Um, yeah, okay. You know, I'm speaking from JNU and the internet has a way of going off when it doesn't want to hear something and uh, so I mean, you may have to have to you may have to you know my phone is next to me you may have to call me if it gets disconnected so uh, i thank naveen and ram for having invited me to participate in this session of a series of workshops and uh, yeah as one may complain about zoom meetings and talking to a laptop that uh, simulates a conversation. 
uh, there is nothing very much one can do to rectify the situation uh, just now. Um, uh, this morning, I received a phone call from an old friend who known to most of us here, Shri Vishwanathan, basically to find out if I was still alive. Um, and then during the course of the conversation, he said that, you know, I mean, uh, we are all troglodytes now, you know, I mean, uh, we are all cavemen and probably out of date. Um, and so I found that as an interesting way of refacing my, my remarks this morning. Um, I read the two papers with great interest, and I think uh, uh, both uh, the presenters today have covered them adequately. Um, and I do not wish to pose any questions or voice any disagreement with either, either of them. Uh, Naveen informed me, I think, yesterday that I could use this, this opportunity to digress into some of the issues discussed uh, in my article that appeared in the edited volume published by uh, Tejaswini Aniranjana and Anupdhar. Uh, he will forgive me for not playing by that script, but by raising some of the issues that appear in my own recent work. Uh, both these papers just presented offer, the, offer us very important accounts, amongst many others, about the vocation of STS in India and the attempt to get teaching and research programs going at their respective institutions and universities. Um, and I suppose other papers will furnish experiences which are quite similar and different. Uh, I shall draw on some of the issues raised in these papers in order to elaborate upon the prospects and changing uh, canvas of STS. Uh, reading through the first part of Sundra's uh, paper, one got a sense of uh, a kind of homelessness of the sociology of science in a sociology program. Uh, the latter part of the paper is more positive when discussing matters of pedagogy and teaching as a craft. On the second, on the other hand, the second paper details the history of the career of STS at DAICT, um, its promise and its extent, uh, but ends on a more despondent note due to the possible failure of uh, integration. Uh, but then integration, whether strong or weak, is always a problem and uh, one needs to ask uh, why, all right? As uh, someone who has been involved at two ICERs and some of the discussion on integration at one of them, namely Mohali, where uh, Professor Arvin from ICER Mohali invited Sundar Sarukai and myself to help formulate the HSS program. Uh, one wonders even about the virtues of weak integration, where students have the option of choosing courses in the first two years before they opt for some kind of disciplinary or interdisciplinary uh, specialization. As I pointed out elsewhere, we have had an interesting history of what used to be called science of science studies in the late 1950s and the 60s, social stu studies of science, science studies, and finally, STS. Though the official histories of STS as an academic field date back to the 1960s, the label began to stick in the 1990s. Uh, while attending a workshop on the French physicist Paul Najra in the 1990s, I was talking to the philosopher of physics, Arthur Miller, and he introduced himself as saying, well, you know, I am at the University of California. I was in a history and philosophy of science program, but I've come into STS. It's a way of bringing in more money into the history and philosophy of sciences. And while we have transited through these four, these different phases over the last four decades, what is witnessed is a failure of institutionalization within the academy. While as academic and policy 
concerns these discourses have lived and continue to do so in the interstices of universities uh, and the IITs. I mean, the only CSIR institute which was committed in some sense to the science of science studies based on a vision um, of Rahman is now more or less closed, merged with an institute for science communication studies, and all it will do is policy. So the important concern today arises from the circumstance that we are living through times wherein the academy and the university are undergoing very rapid transition. And this must give us pause to ask an STS question about STS. STS started off with examining the processes of knowledge production within the precincts of structures and institutions, as Thomas Soydequist reminds us, that are a little over just 200 years old. And where the university was long considered and has long been considered the center of knowledge production. Now that the university has not been or may not be the center of knowledge production, it is legitimate to ask, like in the song, where do we go from here? And for this and a variety of other reasons, I mean, the theoretical and the historiographical and other reasons, I mean, a number of historians of sciences today of a certain orientation who recognize the institutional baggage that comes with the term science are beginning now to reprofile themselves as historians of knowledge. Following Christian Jacob, uh, we are all into the histoire, the savoir, the histories of histories of knowledge, which sort of brings STS a lot closer to the humanities after a very long time. Uh, uh, among the many take homes from the two papers. I mean, um, I mean, I, is the kind of marginality of STS in the spectrum of interdisciplinary fields. Whether you take history and philosophy of science as one interdisciplinary field following the historicist turn in the philosophy of science, or you consider history and philosophy of science as distinct and then we have the sociology of science, science communication, and you go on and on. Um, yeah, these are quite marginal when compared with the well-entrenched disciplines and interdisciplinary fields. We could have, therefore, a bank of such stories about STS from different institutional locations in the country. Uh, and as I turn back and look at my own university, I can identify at least eight people, now seven, very soon six, large enough to form a center distributed across five departments and three schools, working on and teaching maybe history of sciences, sociology of science, medical anthropology, theories of innovation, the philosophy of sciences and technology, etc. But they have never managed to come together and organize an event jointly or under one institutional rubric, though some of us constantly refer our students to courses being offered by several others from this group of eight, seven, six. This neglect of science and society is rather paradoxical at a time, as Jerry Houghton pointed out many decades ago, when science has ascended to the center of the university and contemporary culture. Both these papers very nicely map out the structural impediments within the university and institutes they discuss. The pedagogic obstacle the opportunities, the student preferences, the wider social context of higher education, and in a way, the legacy of the three cultural divide. Vasundara's paper reminded me of a workshop that the late lamented Yehuda Elkanah had organized on the future of Mertonian sociology, where the surviving Mertonians were well represented. As one of the participants, I had commenced my fieldwork by speaking to Andre Betai during one of his visits to JNU about the inclusion of Merton in the courses at Delhi School and was surprised to learn, and was not surprised to learn, that while Merton was included, it was his social theory and social structure that was part of the reading. Familiar, uh, 
with his ideas about social stratification, manifest and latent, and latent functions, etc., but not his work on the sociology of science. I think the story is true of JNU sociology as well, though Merton sociology was studied at the Center for Science Policy in its first incarnation, all right? The center was closed, I think, in the early 80s and reopened in the mid 90s. So I was talking of, <clears throat> all right? Thus the figure and work of Merton loomed over science policy circles that had hitherto been influenced by Bernal and the science of sciences. Uh, so the papers presented today, as well as the papers to be presented perhaps in the future, I'm sure will provide a, a rich collection of such narratives of the prehistory and subsequent career of SPS in India, and will also underscore the importance of preserving its diversity, while at the same time emphasizing the need for some mid-course changes. The diversity of a, of a curriculum, I would believe, is the only weapon against a centrally imposed curriculum. And one supports that the institutes drawn into this discussion have the academic resources to develop SPS programs. What I'm not sure about is whether SPS can deliver on its promise as a linked discipline between the three cultures for a variety of other reasons. For it is not a matter of surprise how fast these constellations of knowledge retreat into the security of their disciplinary or interdisciplinary dwellings. The university is indeed a universe, but it can simultaneously be a fairly closed world. For example, you know, I could remember occasions when I organized lectures by the philosopher of science, Helen Longino to speak on two different books she had published, uh, The Fate of Knowledge and Studying Human Behavior. And other than colleagues and students from my center, those present were from philosophy alone. On another occasion, we had Langdon Winner, I mean, I think two years ago, speak on the politics of digital technology. And then in addition to the host center, we had students only from science policy. On either occasion, there were no science students or from students from any of the other faculty where, I mean, people were studying science also. However, that interaction has, has begun to change over, I would say, the last two years for a set of other reasons. It appears then that some kind of institutional identity and not just the cognitive one is essential, but that does not solve the problem of bridging these boundaries. Furthermore, and on this point, uh, there could be different views. We do know that Harry Collins lived inside an experiment on gravitational waves for more than 20 years. And at the end of which, he almost went native when he argued in a paper entitled Third Wave. Well, yeah, it was something like that. The SPS scholars could actually contribute to science if they tried hard enough. Many disagreed, and I would count myself among those who do. Uh, this conservatism also explains, you know, my agreement with the philosopher of physics, uh, Michela Massini, who writes that it is not the job of philosophers of science to do science or to give verdicts on one theory over another or to tell scientists how to go about their business. She believes it is the job of philosophers of science to contribute to the public discourse on the values of science and to make sure that discussions about the role of evidence, the accuracy and reliability of scientific theories and the effectiveness of methodological approaches are properly investigated. She goes on to argue that she sees philosophy of science as delivering an important social function namely making the general public aware of the importance of science. So philosophers of science become public intellectuals who speak up for science, rectify common misconceptions or uninformed judgments that may feed into political lobbies, agendas, and ultimately policy making. 
I'll come back to this point uh, uh, at the end of my remarks. Let us not forget that STS is internally quite fractured as well, as are the other disciplines. And STS too has its own hierarchy. Historians proper doing history of science, those working on the history of scientific ideas talk across each other. I think this is a point also that Matumit is making. And in turn, would look down upon scientist historians. And this is to the detriment of the history of science in India. In almost two dec decades at JNU, I participated in only one meeting where a scientist, H.S. Mukunda from the Institute of Science, Bangalore, and a historian and philosopher of science spoke at the same platform, thanks to the efforts of my colleague, Jan Kinayal. In a way, even that was cheating because you know, I had worked with Professor Mukunda before many, many years ago. I remember a discussion I had with Tajit Basu's PhD supervisor two years ago, Mitchell Ash, where um, he was telling me about his work on science in during Nazi Germany, his more recent work. And I said, okay, you know, I, I saw I myself had fallen into this trap. I said, you know, Mitch, I have two questions. I have a historian's question and a historian of science's question. And we both laughed. So it appears then these sort of tribal identities often trump others. Again, Kim Fortune once asked me at a meeting, I think even Naveen was there at that meeting, once, once asked me, why do you HPS types despise us STS people? And I responded, do I? I suppose this is the way bodies of knowledge are arranged within teaching and research contexts, and those of us in STS or HPS, or sociology of science, or history of science, or technology policy, or philosophy, or whatever it be, could play, or maybe should play, the game differently. Right, which is why I find that imposing our, our perspectives and methodological preferences to the methodological protocols of students as technophilia, or in JNU, positivism, is problematic. In the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, I mean, Professor Ramesh Kohl, formerly from, I mean, formerly at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai, but then at Bangalore, uh, the particle physicist, Arvind, of course, from Isar Mohali, uh, Pinaki Majumdar, currently director of the Harish Chandra Institute, at the time they were all PhD students, we ran a, a study circle at IIC Bangalore on science and society. And it was more or less impossible for us to get engineers into the group. Part of the reason was the preponderance of physicists and physics students who saw themselves as uh, princes of the mind. And our readings themselves were so science focused that we, and we were really quite oblivious of this fact. And it was then that we gradually discovered Walter Vincenti's marvelous work, How Engineers Think. And a subsequent paper he wrote in response to social constructivism, a classic called The Technological Shaping of Technology. All right, and it, uh, Edda Kranakis' work from the eight, 1980s had already revealed as far, the, I mean, had already revealed the multiplicity of engineering traditions. Although that diversity was rooted in national traditions of French engineering, German engineering, I suppose it would extend to schools as well. And this is something we see in a very nice interview given by Professor Rodam Narasimha on how Goitingen engineering or engineering science arrived at the Institute of Science Bangalore. So when we impose our, our paradigm or tend to see technophilia in the work of our engineers, we should not forget Kuhn's fundamental insight that the imparting of a paradigm is fundamentally in the sciences and technology is fundamentally a dogmatic activity and the poor student is just being socialized into it. What posture does the STS scholar adopt here? I think there are certain advantages of living at the margins and at the in the interstices of the academy. And while saying this, I don't wish to romanticize that position. Nicole Lapierre in her classic paper on the epistemological privilege of the stranger evokes Zimmel, to which I would like to add, of course, Weblen. 
and the importance of the position of the stranger in formulating more resilient concepts and explanations. Weblen would indeed argue that it even opens up creative possibilities. Uh, in the time left to me, uh, Naveen, how much is that? 15 minutes? I would, yeah, yeah. I would like to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I would like to talk about some of the concerns uh, <clears throat> of where STS in its cognate interdisciplinary manifestation of HTS could play in mentoring students for research. So I'm looking at the other end since that's you know where I have been located for the last couple of decades. Now. At the turn of the millennium, several of us took our STS HPS's toolkit to, into studies on higher education. And several interdisciplinary fields have offered fruitful resources for examining higher education and its transformation. However, in examining this transformation in the world of higher education, the history and philosophy of science has had quite a marginal role to play. For more than half a century now, educationists have spoken of the importance of history and philosophy of science for science education, the Nuffield experiment in physics, et cetera, et cetera, particularly at the secondary level, but more specifically for school science. The unfortunate part is that when I entered the field in the 1980s, we began to see these papers appearing, research papers arguing for the salience of history and philosophy of science. Even today, 50, or 40 years later, you still get papers which are making the same argument. This clearly suggests that the progress along this axis of pedagogic improvisation and reform has been very slow. What surprises me is we have never seen any related discussion on the importance of history and philosophy of science for undergraduate physics teaching or even postgraduate teaching. And it is not that there is a dearth of such problems to address. So while this is one of the issues that has concerned me, I should speak about on the <clears throat> I shall speak about issues that I have confronted being in JNU, namely the divide that runs through the Academy of Teaching and Research, splintering into it into many worlds and presents itself as uh, what Madhumita would refer to as the ideological class. This fragments the academy, particularly at a time when it should be united in its defense of expert knowledge. All right. Now, how can we re-engineer our teaching and research protocols and revise the fragmented imaginaries of the research world? Madhumita Mazumdar raised a related issue in her brief discussion on the importance of disciplinary history. The contextualization of disciplines could help address an issue that resides at the core of doctoral instruction in the academy and takes on the dimensions of a cultural and ideological divide. Doctoral programs in the sciences and social sciences tend to asymmetrically undermine the latter with respect to the former and thereby create hierarchies. The sciences in this imaginary are characterized by what Sal Sal Restivo had called a John Wayne epistemology. They represented more exact, certain, robust knowledge where problem definition was oriented, uh, was so oriented that there was a greater commitment to consensus seeking, while the imaginary of the social sciences uh, <clears throat> was one where there was greater controversy. What is true, however, is a closer exploration of the HPS literature reveals that there is greater controversy in the sciences than the practitioners acknowledge or are aware of. Nevertheless, graduate students in the sciences are seduced by the imaginary into believing what Yehuda Elkanah would call a dream world of putative consensus and shared premises. The social sciences, on the other hand, were seen to be immobilized by their interpretive flexibility and multiplicity of perspectives. While not disagreeing that the humanities and social sciences are, are messy and marked by turmoil and deal with complexity, the natural sciences are also no different. For even in the natural sciences, there are no theories of everything. 
primarily because theoretical structures are far from complete. Their foundations are mired in presuppositions and contradictions, and these presuppositions themselves are constantly shifting and are revised by the theories as they evolve. All right, so in other words, while in the humanities and the social sciences, disagreement on basics is considered as an intellectual desideratum, analogous differences in the sciences are never verbalized in the socialization of doctoral students. There is what I would like to call a consensus about consensus that has resulted in the marginalization of the space for what, for dialectical thinking. Though dialectical thinking fundamentally engages with contradictions, there is a concomitant recognition that different framings of questions yield different answers. Yehuda Elkanah pointed out that in the curricular world, I mean, he spent the last years of his life studying the, the, what philosophy of science could offer a, a liberal curriculum and also doctoral mentoring. And he says, within this curricul curricular world, dialectical thinking is often dismissed as Marxist, and its promise is lost to the contemporary academy. How does one explain this blanket accept acceptance of a culture of consensus? In the essential tension, Kuhn had argued that as the science becomes more mature or the theory gets increasingly formalized, the policy surrounding the theory collapses and it becomes monoparadigmatic, mono ergo consensual. Once the idea of consensus is accepted, it follows that the compulsions for, con for conceptual change or scientific revolution are internally generated. But scientists such as Weinberg disagree with Kuhn. So far, as he says, there is no science which in any stage of its development is monoparadigmatic. Leaders of a scientific field are always articulating competing paradigms. The whole field of what is referred to as the history of concepts and even of the history of ideas would suggest that in practice, the social sciences accept and welcome this feature as intrinsic to the pursuit. The natural sciences see this transient this transience as a passing phenomena on the highway to objective truth. The remedy does not reside in making changes to the content of doctoral programs in the sciences, but in focusing attention in addition to aspects that are ignored by the protocols internalized by science students. A survey amongst doctoral students might reveal what constitutes knowledge and maybe how adequate that conception is. How do students learn to orient their research in a disciplinary or interdisciplinary format confronted with competing paradigms? Now, on this count, I return again to Elkanah, who evokes the different premises of the foundations of physics that separate the work of, say, theoretical of the theoretical condensed matter physicist Philip Anderson and that of the high energy physicist Stephen Heidberg, both Nobel laureates. These foundational differences do not surface in conflicting advice to review committees on whether a superconducting collider should be funded or not, or how physics is presented in textbooks. Weinberg and Anderson. And their students would not disagree on the fundamentals of physics, but the two physicists and their associated networks would have difficult, different responses to the two questions. Are we approaching a final theory? Do different, and the second, do different levels of organization of matter obey different sets of laws that are not necessarily reducible to one theory? The examples could be multiplied, and that is one of the things I'm doing nowadays, is collecting such examples. In a special issue of studies in the history and philosophy of physics, Gallison and Warwick extend the methods of anthropology to look at cultures of theory, including mathematical physics. The extension of the methods of anthropology involves studying relatively small communities of practicing scientists. It seeks to understand theories and experiments not as idealized or verified entities, but as part of the daily lived experience of collections of individuals. This kind of approach 
has already been applied to the history of the experimental sciences. But the literature on the theoretical side is less developed. The symmetry arises, Gallison and Warwick point out, due in part to a prejudgment that while experiments can be historicized through the material culture, theories are isolated. They are ready-made products which transcend historical time and place of their making. The papers in this volume on the study of the history and philosophy of physics seek to capture the manifold practices of theory, to capture distinct aspects of particular theoretical communication from Georgian Cambridge, England to contemporary chaoticians. So while different conceptions of theory that separate communities of theoretical physicists uh, we have here an opportunity to bring in hermeneutics into the science disciplines. The point was driven home in the work of Patrick Healan, who pointed out that science too has its hermeneutic tasks. The ideology of science inculcated among scientists is founded on the ideal, on a particular ideal of knowledge that needs no re reiterating. <clears throat> All right. So, So, I mean, we replace this view by asking ourselves a set of contextualist questions, right? Where does knowledge come from? What problems are considered important by the scientific communities? Right? What is the social context within this knowledge is embedded? We do know that the 19th century was dominated by a kind of rational, dogmatic, universalistic character of the Enlightenment that came to be interrogated by the pragmatists such as Peirce, Dewey, Toulmin, and Rorty. The Enlightened frame did recognize the importance of complexity. The actual science pursued did not until very recently. Just sorry, uh, uh, we have two minutes. Maybe you could take it up. All right, okay. So, uh, all right. Uh, the rest of the text basically, I mean, picks up a number of examples on how the new work in the in 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 SDS could inform the curriculum. I'll come to the last point and then I think I'll 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 finish. Now, um, in an increasingly complex system of knowledge production, where fields emerge and disappear rapidly. I think there is a new task for the historian and the philosopher of science. All right, basically that of looking at the conceptual and theoretical connectivities between seemingly disparate frames and bodies of knowledge. This will demand a return to HPS and not philosophy of science or history of science, but to HPS, all right? Uh, and I think this function appears to be a very ambitious one where the role of the historian and philosopher of science is to, is to basically elicit what are the conceptual connections between different kinds of disciplines. I remember a colleague and I were recently, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, were asked to write a paper for the European Journal of Physics that how can interdisciplinary fields co uh, contribute to their parent discipline? And we were surprised to learn in the 19th century how much traffic there was between economics and physics, you know, especially between thermodynamics and debates on value and efficiency. I mean, this is a new kind of task that will need to be, uh, which will need to be performed. All right, and so, uh, yeah. So the inter and trans relationship between the sciences and the social sciences which is at the forefront of a contemporary debates in fields such as diverse as fields as diverse as cognitive and behavioral sciences and evolutionary anthropology will pose new kinds of problems for HPS. Now, many of the problems I have alluded to arise from the commitments of teachers and researchers within universities of teaching and research. STS provides us the language for articulating and problematizing many of the issues raised by the papers presented here. In the presentation, I've spoken about what may be alluded to as academic SPS, STS. 
But there are two more strains that have played an important role in constituting SPS so designated. The technocratic or policy oriented and the critical or that based on science activism. All right. And we don't know how the latter is deeply, how the latter two are deeply intertwined with the academic. Now, taking cognizance of especially uh, uh, science activism and its contribution to the STS, I think that has opened up uh, the boundaries of what we consider uh, to be knowledge itself. All right. Uh, one of the questions, for example, I've been looking into is the, the politics around indigeneity and indigenous knowledge. That's not something I'd like to go into now. But uh, yeah, I'd like to stop here. Uh, there was a, a last point I would have liked to make. And um, basically, uh, the overlap in, in current debates on the philosophy of sciences and the social sciences. Right? We've always been talking about, I mean, given the genealogy of the social sciences, of the distinction between the philosophy of science and social sciences and an overplayed debate, which then provides legitimacy uh, to an ideological war in the social sciences, the debate between Adorno and Popper. I think the new work of Harold Kincaid and others will provide provides us new avenues for bridging this divide between the sciences and the social sciences. I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Uh, can I uh, uh, request Madhumita to respond? And then, thank you. Okay, so uh, first of all, I begin by expressing my thanks to Naveen and Professor Ram Ramaswamy for this opportunity. I think I never had an opportunity to talk about STS at any forum uh, in this manner. And of course, then to Vasundhara for presenting the basic argument of my people. Now, I think Professor Raina invoked Shiv Vishwanathan, and of course, I have to, uh, I remain indebted to Shiv for helping me make the transition from uh, being interested in the social history of science to larger questions uh, relating to the field of STS. Interestingly, I mean, this is just an aside, but um, I'd love to uh, you know, share this, that uh, when I was interviewed for the job in uh, DAICT, uh, Shiv asked me, so Madhumita, if we were to open a new, a new STS department, who are the people you want to recruit, dead or alive? And um, so, of course, I was just come out with my uh, PhD and I was still, uh, you know, in the world of Schaffer and Shapin and Latour and, of course, Professor Dhruv Raina and so on and so forth. And he asked me, you wouldn't hire PC Ray? Uh, you wouldn't hire any of the historians or the scientists turned historians? And it just struck me because my PhD, in, in my PhD, I had had an entire chapter focused on P.C. Ray's history and his historical sensibility, but didn't occur to me that in an STS department, why would not P.C. Ray feature? But the point I was trying to make is that we began an experiment of sorts in DAICT, and I here use the word strong integration, not in the informed sense from the strategy paper, which we have read and invoked, uh, because really we did not have opportunities for the kind of dialogues between disciplines, but it was strong in a different sense that whereas in the IITs and the NITs and Bits Pilani, et cetera, the humanities and social sciences were offered as electives. In DIICT, the humanities and social science components were deemed core and they were woven within the core technical curriculum. And of course, as I said, that Tridip Surud and Shiv Vishwanathan and Vishwajit Pandya were the trio who put this into, and each coming from different kinds of disciplines, who believed that if we were to generate a kind of sensibility for introducing something like STS, it would be good to first introduce students to broader uh, sociological awareness through, let's say, the disciplinary inputs from sociology and anthropology with Shiv and Vishwajit had, 
to introduce students to political economy because many of most of them had not studied economics and then to come to STS and then move into the mandatory environmental science course, which they had to do at the um, undergrad level. So in terms of a strong integration, the idea was that hopefully they would be able to relate some of the questions that we were raising uh, to the sort of things they were learning. But of course, students, the moment they ask, why are we doing this uh, HSS courses? And when, when it came to mind, they would say, I would ask them, so what are you expecting from this course? So they would say that we want to understand possibly uh, the social impacts of science. I, I think they were clear that this was about impacts of science. So the moment one raised questions about epistemology, about power, about uh, the field of STS, its contextual uh, underpinnings, I mean, those questions didn't seem quite relevant. When Shiv was around, of course, we had these opportunities to talk about these pedagogical challenges. But then there was this uh, question, somewhat awkward question, for me to actually uh, you know, explain to my uh, to faculty, my colleagues out there, they said, why is, it, why is your STS course so faculty dependent? Uh, why is there no standardization? And if we are to have a core course, we must have a standardized syllabi. And I couldn't for my life explain to them exactly what Vasundara was trying to invoke in her paper that even though the subject is this unified subject, because STS and it's uh, you know, developed over a, it was multi-sided, it developed across different kinds of disciplines, it was difficult to standardize it. And the argument was this multiplicity of approaches confused students at an undergrad level. At an undergrad level. And they said, if you can't uh, uh, you know, standardize it, they don't get the real purpose of what you are doing. Now, of course, in today's world, uh, I believe that there are these standardized uh, textbooks. For example, there is a book which uh, uh, a lot of young students are introduced to, uh, which is by Sergio Sismondo. It's called, I think, An Introduction to STS. Uh, so, there was this question about standardization. There was this question about why should STS be faculty dependent? Third, of course, was the general kind of question of uh, it being uh, whether of what utility. Now, of course, these had to be explained in different kinds of contexts and different ways. And as Vasudhara invoked, and I did in my paper, that Ethnographic work, the project work, was the only fruitful point of entry through which this course could be accessed by students. The textual part of it remained, of course, hazy to most, but let's say the 10% in the class were able to get what we were driving at. But in a class of 240 and now 350, this text heavy mode was becoming very difficult to. Uh, actually yield too much. So, um, so what I was trying to say is that while, and this is I'm invoking a paper which will possibly come up later in the afternoon, but which of course is also invoked by Vasundhara, while these epistemological questions about integration can be addressed with the kind of initiatives Professor Raina just talked about and the role of uh, HPS, there is this persistent problem of understanding institutional and learning cultures and the kind of students who come in and how do we actually, particularly at the undergrad level. At the post-graduation level, it is perhaps slightly more easier to integrate these through research projects, et cetera, but as an underground survey course, uh, how do we actually address these problems of pedagogy? So I think epistemology and pedagogy uh, in different contexts, because and I, in my paper, I purposely introduced the kind of way in which our program was constituted to 
draw attention to both the contingent and the historical circumstances within which curriculums are designed. It's not as if people who were designing this curriculum were reading out from a policy paper or whatever. It was their putting together of something they had in mind. And I think somebody like Shivishwanathan, who himself sees himself as a nomad, intellectually, academically, and otherwise, found the possibilities of doing something which could be not just interdisciplinary, but transdisciplinary. And I think this is also one point which I want to make an end uh, before other questions come up, that the strong program that we wanted to initiate at the AICT wanted to be an interdisciplinary one and maybe move towards some sort of phenomenon based teaching towards the end, which could transcend disciplinary bounds. But then the concepts of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity don't, uh, are sort of in a way, uh, are not understood very well or put into practice. So it's not just a question of students not getting us. It's also about us faculty not being able to uh, develop our thoughts and translate them into particular kinds of teaching material. So the integration, the intent of integration, in fact, I would be happy to say that the, you know, the core structure still remains the same, uh, you know, because students, alum in particular, have lauded DICT structure because they feel that the humanities social sciences input that they got actually helped them later, if not at that particular point. So the structure remains. But how well it would be delivered and how meaningfully it would be developed is something that remains to be seen. So I'm going to stop here and maybe take questions later. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Madhuri. That's great timing. Uh, now, can I invite Vasundara to respond? Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, first, thank you to Sanil for introducing my paper. And thank you to Professor Rena for giving his thoughts and going through our papers. Um, I'm just going to reflect a little bit on what Professor Rena shared with us. Um, so yes, he talked about the vocation of STS in India and the prospects and changing, changing canvas of STS. Um, and uh, thank you for identifying that uh, even though I started off homeless, um, I am much more uh, hopeful now and hopefully heading in a promising direction. But I think that that is in response to how um, science is viewed within uh, the, the possibility of science studies is viewed within the social sciences. For instance, I would say that um, to get greater traction as an academic, uh, because I'm trying to identify my work at the intersection of environment and science, do I, do I think it is more hopeful in particular ways versus um, other ways of looking at it. And I, I think that's an important point that um, uh, cannot be ignored in really how there is um, the prospects and changing canvas of STS in the larger uh, world that the academic world we live in, right? So that was one thing that I wanted to uh, definitely respond to you about. Uh, the second theme that Dr. Uh, Rena talked about was um, marginality of STS in the spectrum of interdisciplinarity. And what I've learned in the first panel today, and I think it's something that uh, the organizers and all of us are really thinking about, if none of us have said it, foregrounded it, uh, the question of a liberal arts program and the question of having electives, it really positions STS very differently. Uh, for example, in, in SNU, if, if we, there have been part of some meetings to try to get a liberal arts program started and many colleagues in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences has, have said, we cannot even envision that until you get the School of Natural Sciences to be part of the meeting. Um, which is absolutely correct, but what do we do to get them um, involved, right? Um, that's one. The second is that in the IIT uh, model and in the Dhirubhai Ambani Institute model, um, you have broadly engineering DTEC students coming to your classrooms to do uh, courses in the humanities and social sciences. My experience in SNU is different because I have a mix of sociology majors, of English majors, of history majors, along with a few engineering students. And I do think that impacts the pedagogy um, and the engagement in the classroom. So the possibility of these different kinds of models, what the NEP is putting forth as interdisciplinarity and how that will pan out in the future 
liberal arts program, university that has primarily engineering students or not. I think those are all uh, factors that will affect the future of STS in India. Um, right. Um, I also want to respond to a doctor, and I think I've already uh, said this uh, a little bit earlier, but he talks about, he talked about the, how fractured internally within, um, within S the STS and within a department such as history or sociology, um, uh, these issues of a historian of science or a scientist of historians, et cetera, et cetera, um, engage with each other. Um, and uh, that is something that we, we should take into account. This also plays out what Madhumita was alluding to. Um, it's really individuals who will bring science to the curriculum versus a central disciplinary location. Um, um, for example, I started offering the sociology of science after I came to this department. And this is not to say that other colleagues could not offer it, but uh, it just doesn't happen in the, in the same way. So um, there is that kind of a, a fracture internally within departments is also an important point to uh, think about. Um, and uh, this, the last point that Dr. Rena raised that I think we should all be considering, I did not think about it in my paper at all, but it's definitely important for the future of STS in India is the divide in the academy between teaching and research. Um, PhD scholars, for example, in, in our department at SNU, um, PhD scholars across the university have to do a course in academic reading and writing. The questions like why shouldn't they have to do a course on um, science or epistemological knowledge formations, uh, that's never even been part of the dialogue, right? Um, so we might have a UG student who has done a sociology of science here. Will that translate to them doing research in, in, in STS? Uh, if we have a, a sociology PhD scholar who wants to work on cosmopolitanism, should they be in a classroom that engages with technology and science? Those are, I think, very important uh, conversations and issues to consider. Um, really has to speak about the marginality of science within core disciplines. Um, and also just probing at how interdisciplinarity is understood. I mean, in one of the conversations earlier in, in the university here was, you cannot think about interdisciplinarity without first having a sense of disciplinarity. Um, so how do you bridge those divides? Do you have departments at all or not? And of course, structural issues in um, universities. So I, I'll stop there, Naveen. Just, just wanted to respond to the themes that stood out to me in um, Dr. Rena's points. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Vasindra. Um, yeah, so we have, uh, we have good. So I was feeling guilty that we have eaten up into uh, the open session, uh, uh, but thankfully we have only lost four minutes or so. Uh, now the floor is open to folks. I have uh, typed the uh, invitation to, uh, to the chat box for any particular intervention. You could also raise your hand and then I could, uh, uh, Pass on the mic to you, so to say. How do I? Okay, so the floor is open now. Mm -hmm. Ask to unmute. Um, just ask any whoever wants to speak uh, yeah. in the order that you call yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we are waiting for our hands to come up. Uh, I had a question while uh, we wait for other interventions. I mean, it's, I quite uh, uh, like the fact that in many ways we have gone reflexive in terms of uh, the question of interdisciplinarity. Usually uh, earlier on was framed in terms of how is it that uh, 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 this technology and science types, sorry to say, put it in that way, they don't see the necessity for interdisciplinarity, the, uh, the necessity to, uh, uh, the utility, so to say, uh, of the uh, uh, knowledge which is coming through some humanities, social sciences in their education. That's a sort of uh, a framing which you see generally earlier on. But, and yet, uh, through our own experiences and in the paper, we also see a flavor of how, um, the difficulties of disciplinary boundaries being particularly uh, uh, strong, even within uh, uh, humanities and social sciences, particularly so when they reside within SMT educational institution spaces. 
So, um, so is it possible to speculate that these kinds of disciplinary resistances uh, increase within uh, uh, the HSS uh, uh, homes when they are housed in SMT spaces? Is that a possibility we should think about? And this is also echoing what Vasudeva was uh, trying to point out at some point. And also what Dhruv uh, mentioned is tribal loyalties and affiliations of some kind. So how is it that we can think about uh, 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 this uh, hardening of disciplinary position uh, within humanities uh, in this SMT education? So I thought uh, I could invite uh, uh, the three of the panelists at some Maybe other to respond to it. Uh, what are the ways in which we can think about it, and how do we approach it? So, to the echo pad, not to diffuse in my uh, uh, question here. Yeah. So, it, it would be useful for uh, Dhruv, Madhmita, and uh, Vasudeva to uh, respond to it in some way. But uh, uh, more so, uh, Madhmita and Dhruv, because uh, they have talked about it in Vasudeva, especially in the question of sociology within uh, SME. Be uh, useful to hear more about. Yeah, uh, uh, Naveen, I won't switch on my video. If you, right, uh, I, there's a little problem here. Is that okay? I'll just, yeah. Okay. Uh, should I respond uh, briefly? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, please uh, go on, uh, Professor Andrews. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, Naveen. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, you know, if you look at the history of, of interdisciplinarity, you know, the first interdisciplinary fields emerged within the sciences themselves, whether it's biochemistry or biophysics or those kinds of fields, if you look, all right, the 19th century being that of disciplinary formation, but the first interdisciplinary fields. And what we have seen, I mean, as students of interdisciplinarity is that it's much easier to forge what you might call a narrow interdisciplinarity, that is, say, within adjacent fields in the sciences or within adjacent fields in the social sciences, perhaps, then it is to forge a broad interdisciplinarity between the sciences and social sciences. All right? Now, there are fields between the sciences and the social sciences which have some kind of elective affinity. For example, anthropology and evolutionary biology. We are beginning to see some... some um, uh, you know, inter-transdisciplinary fields emerging along those axes. And as, uh, you know, Prajit more or less made a prediction about 10 years ago that the behavioral sciences will really be the sciences where we, we will see new models of, of transdisciplinarity. Uh, my own feeling is, you know, I, I don't, although I do social sciences, I don't make it a point to speak about the social sciences too much, but uh, my own feeling is, uh, speaking to my uh, my colleagues within JNU, uh, which was founded as an interdisciplinary university, in some sense, the I mean, there are fields where you cannot but be interdisciplinary. For example, something like community health, or for example, you know, fields like um, inter you know, I mean, the different schools in uh, departments in international relations. But there are fields which have a kind of disciplinary fundamentalism in the social sciences. And I would say, maybe as Vasundra was saying, maybe sociology and economics are like that. All right. The, and uh, the, you know, I mean, the economists might argue in terms of an economic reductionism and sociology might argue in terms of a sociological reductionism. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I once presented a paper to irritate my sociologist colleagues who is afraid of interdisciplinarity. All right, I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, uh, I'll just uh, point out two things that the question of interdisciplinarity, as I have observed in my own institute, is not just confined to the STS, you know, constellation of subjects. You know, we offer ICT, which is Information Communication Technology. Anyone you ask, uh, any student, is still quite uh, not sure as to how to define ICT. Is it um, 
a combination of computer science, electronics, and um, you know, communications. So if so, how does that combination work? <clears throat> what is the sort of soul of ICT? Is it software or hardware or communications, analog or digital? I mean, these conversations are not easy conversations within the engineering uh, group. And I see that happening all the time. So ICT was meant to be a classic interdisciplinary technical program, but that interdisciplinarity has also faltered. That's one part of the story. But in the case of our own, uh, as far as the humanities social sciences is concerned, we tried, as I said, that to bring in, uh, in fact, there was an uh, you know, introductory course to ICT in the first year, where the idea was that technical faculty and humanities and social science faculty would come together to talk about ICT, both in its technical aspects as well as its contextual aspects. So, but once again, it worked and then it didn't work. But when we talk about contextuality, and when we, that is the way we try to bring in the different uh, disciplinary perspectives. Because either we are looking at context temporally, uh, change over time in a historical mode, or sociologically, or through the lens of anthropology. So students are constantly asked to be aware of the complexity of context. So if, for example, when they are sent out into the field to understand whether a particular project around digital India, let's say just introducing digital literacy in rural Gujarat, what is working and what is not, are they able to make the connections, particularly when there is a question of access? For example, computers are installed in a panchayat office, who gets first access and training and why and why not? So how are they being able to take the questions of caste and other kinds of stratification into the field and able to understand the way in which adoption of technology works out? So in other words, when we are looking at the history of technology, for example, I introduce a component called the history of computing. And I was, for my own interest, I was looking at the IEEE annals of computing, you know, the journal. Interestingly, from the 60s onwards, there has been a great deal of interest in the history of computing. But it is largely what one would call the demand side history, sorry, the supply side history, looking at the various changes in the engineering aspect of computing. By the late 1990s, Practicing uh, computer scientists themselves said that this is not what a history of computing should be. We should look at the complexities of the demand side. In other words, looking at uh, adoption, rejection, uh, adaptation, cultural issues, et cetera, et cetera. So understanding or rather focusing on the history of technology or history of science from both uh, what IEEE called the supply side and the demand side will in any way push you towards an understanding of context and the understanding of the layers of complexity, demand, interdisciplinary approaches. So that's how I was trying to also try, you know, uh, posite my particular component in the SDS. But of course, as I said, it's a very limited effort, uh, not always work out in very large contexts. I just take the one small field, but there are possibilities. That's all I'm saying that there's a limited point over here that there are possibilities may not be that you know, different faculty come and bring in their different approaches, but you, know, you have to operate, many of us have had to operate in autodidact mode. We've had to learn on the job and try to figure out how to pose these questions. So that's one limited effort. But of course, um, 
there has to be much more rigor in that approach, which I do not have. So clearly, uh, my attempt still is amateurish. So that amateur curiosity is something that I uh, bring into my interdisciplinary approach to uh, SDS. Okay, I'll, uh, sh should I go for it, Naveen, Ram? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I, I just wanted to bring a, a slightly different part of the conversation here because uh, Hari Babu, who is, uh, you know, uh, on chat, we've had something. Uh, you see, the, the, the main point is this. Between universities and the technical institutes or the specialized institutes, there seems to be a divide. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, the kinds of questions that uh, we find at, at the universities um, uh, it is uh, that the disciplinary uh, territoriality, as Drew put it, the, you know, the tribal culture over there. Uh, most people in a in a typical science department in a in a multidisciplinary university like even JNU uh, would not quote unquote allow their students to go and take courses in other departments. Uh, because, you know, the curriculum is, uh, you know, you can't cover the portion of the syllabus or what have you. Uh, right. Uh, and this is something that I think Professor Haribabu has also uh, was uh, trying to alert us to in discussion. Can I invite uh, Haribabu to say a few words at, on this point over here, Hari, if you are there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Please just go ahead. Uh, good morning to all of you. It's an interesting kind of session that we had. Uh, the papers were very interesting. We also should see how uh, the education is organized. And uh, as I said, as people pointed out, the kind of uh, disciplinary kind of cultures that dominate the knowledge production. And uh, in a teaching institution, what is, uh, I mean, the knowledge production is divided into departments and uh, within departments of specializations and so on. Now, let me give you an example of uh, how these uh, departments look at their own, uh, their own curriculum and what they expect the students to do so that the students become uh, well-trained in that particular discipline, quote, unquote. So, uh, see, I'll give you an example. We are trying to evolve a five-year integrated program in the University of Hyderabad which was supposed to be an integrated program where science students would be allowed to do some social science courses and social science students are allowed to, were supposed to be doing some courses in sciences. But interesting kind of uh, uh, viewpoints were expressed by science faculty. They said, what is the point in a chemistry student doing a course in history of science, right? Offering one more course in chemistry, we are going to make him a better chemistry student rather than of asking him to a course in history. That is a kind of attitude, right? So if that is the attitude, it's very difficult uh, for the integration of STS studies into curriculum in science departments. And in social sciences, we have another kind of a problem where I taught both at IIT Kanpur and also the University of Hyderabad. I, uh, I taught in Department of Humanities at IIT Kanpur, and also um, I taught sociology in the Department of Sociology at the University of Hyderabad. So here, the social science problem is, as uh, Raina pointed out, if you organize a meeting on science, very few social science would, students would attend, and they uh, would rather say that what is there in uh, it, it's, it, it, science studies don't belong to us, don't belong to social science. Their science studies are very different. They think uh, social studies of science and technology are basically, uh, they, they feel that it is doing science. We say it's not doing science, it's about science, how scientists do their science and how technology is developed, in what context technology is developed, what factors shape the technology and what impacts technology have on society. And uh, this is very important to understand. So uh, social sciences, they tend to, uh, dismiss STS studies as uh, marginal to their own pursuits of you know, uh, studies uh, about society and culture. And in sciences, the problem is that what benefit would science students get by studying a course in STS? 
So that's an issue which also has to be addressed. Thank you. So uh, as I, uh, uh, can I also just read out the two questions uh, which we have uh, in the chat box. One is from Pranav, which I have already requested um, uh, Vasundara to respond to, but uh, let me just read it out for everybody's uh, benefit. For engaging in STA studies, isn't every form of knowledge while engaging in ethnography essentially political from the lens of the author? Does every STS ethnography entail a non-political paradigm while studying a technical artifact? Uh, then uh, Rajeshwari has, uh, uh, has uh, written in, say, I worry about the quest of standardization. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, is that a concern raised to avoid STS or a genuine fear, inability to help students to question discipline? We know that there are core elements, principles of STS that are common to various STS courses. Not much in India, I agree. Isn't that enough? Should there be a standard STS textbook? Uh, and then Dhruv Raina has written in saying, rather than integrated courses, is it so difficult to think of something like the sofa mode? Uh, uh, written starts off in history and comes to physics. This may not be uh, a model for the technological institutes. Radhika Krishna has written in, I agree, standardization would possibly not work given how very different students can be. Now, can I please uh, uh, start with by asking uh, Vasantara to respond to the different ones and then we can Yeah, thanks, Naveen. I was actually typing out my reply, but um, in the spirit of saving time, but I'll quickly reply to Pranab's question. I don't think there is a possibility of any having anything like a non-political paradigm. I mean, this is well-established in the social sciences and humanities generally, but I think especially science studies does take this question head on. Um, my, uh, this comes out most perceptibly to my mind in questions of self-reflexivity um, and method and uh, epistemologies of science. So the, the intent is not to say that there is something like a non-political paradigm at all, but to say that when you engage with a classroom of undergraduate students, um, ethnographies help in explaining what to my mind for social science majors are often considered to be difficult scientific within inverted commas, um, explanations, theories, et cetera, et cetera. That's the, the intent. Um, and, and when I make the point as uh, Professor Sanil shared in my paper about um, uh, looking at the object domain of science and looking at questions like, can there be such a thing as an Indian earth or Indian air? I think the question is really to say, how are things how are ontological entities politicized, rather than saying that there is no politics to it. Um, and then push, pushing at the epistemological questions. Um, I would just, can I, Naveen, can I take one minute more? Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with Rajeshwari that standardization is not a good idea at all. Um, and taking from uh, Professor Rena, narrow interdisciplinarity is absolutely more successful than broader interdisciplinarity without, uh, without a doubt. But I think it's also, I mean, this, workshop has led us to nuance and question the idea of interdisciplinarity, but also question at what level is interdisciplinarity being passed on? Is it at the faculty level? Is it at UG level instruction? Is it at postgraduate? I think these things have a big, big effect on um, how interdisciplinarity is understood. For example, UG students in SNU all have to do, irrespective of history, science, um, physics, mathematics, sociology. They all have to do a course on environmental science and logic um, and academic reading and writing and modernity. But those courses do bring them to our disciplinary classroom, so sociology courses, with questions of what is what. I mean, we do encounter that in the classroom without a doubt. Um, so I'm not giving you an answer. I'm just throwing it more into a question, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Are there other panelists who would like to respond? I just would like to add, add one point. See, it's very important for our science uh, students, uh, students in science departments to know that they should understand science as a process, not as a product. Right? The way textbooks uh, teach science, uh, science is shown as a finished product rather than, uh, rather than describing science as a finished product. We should see science as a process where 
Several factors uh, really influence the process of knowledge production, including a lot of social uh, uh, factors. And this has to be brought into the curriculum of uh, science departments in some sense, some way. If the STS scores can fill that gap, that will be interesting. But I said, there's a lot of resistance from science departments to expose the students to uh, STS studies, right? So I think the students will become more creative if they are told, if they're told. The, uh, that science is a social process and really it's not, it should not be seen as a product. In other words, we should understand us, uh, or they should be exposed to understanding science in making rather than science as a finished product, right? So that uh, kind of dimension should be brought into the curriculum. Thank you. Uh, just one quick intervention. It is really a response to what I've been hearing uh, related to the question of interdisciplinarity and integration. The point which I picked up from Professor Raina and which seems to be more and more now worrying me even further, it's like a conundrum. Uh, it's just that now we've come to a point where it's become increasingly evident that when we are talking about STS or interdisciplinarity, there are distinct institutional distinctions, uh, just as the universities and the technical institutions. Second, as Professor Raina has said, that uh, uh, SDS uh, can be approached from three different kinds of perspectives, technocratic policy perspectives, from academic SDS and um, activist, uh, or rather kind of ideological or politically driven SDS. All of these are political, but I think he made the point. Act. Now is there for the question that, you know, uh, so if these are the institutional divergences and different kinds of spaces that are available for interdisciplinarity, of course, as Rajeshwari says, standardization is just not possible. There have to be some kind of custom made or at least something that is responsive to that particular institutional culture, learning culture, and so on. So yes, there is a push towards standardization from some quarters, but in my opinion, and I'm sure across the table, there are far too many institutional, ideological, and other uh, you know, uh, contexts which have to be addressed when we are talking about integration and interdisciplinarity. Uh, I just have one point, Naveen, and I, I'll stop. Uh, yes. Basically, in response to uh, Vasundhara, at what level does interdisciplinarity begin to percolate or reach out? All right. And I think, uh, you know, I mean, our colleague from JNU, Gurpreet Mahajan, once put it very nicely in a workshop I had organized. Uh, she said, she says that, you know, research, the default op option in research is interdisciplinarity. In research, that is the default option. The problem is interdisciplinary teaching. And oh, that can be hell, you know. I mean, we've tried in my center, we are supposed to be an interdisciplinary department, and we really, really have to work hard to ensure interdisciplinary teaching. So, yeah, you know, I think the bigger problem task is interdisciplinary is interdisciplinary teaching than interdisciplinary interdisciplinary research. I'll stop. Uh, thanks, Dhruv. Um, I was actually commenting to Naveen that, uh, you know, it, it's sort of sad that in a, even in JNU, where, where we've been colleagues for the better part of some 30 years or so, uh, no, none of the science courses actually, science programs like the masters, um, explicitly includes any, um, any, any social science course uh, where our students could be encouraged to think a little outside the box. And uh, this has, I think, to do with uh, autonomy and, the, and how the autonomy, especially in undergraduate institutions that are regulated by the UGC or even the master's programs, they are so tightly uh, regulated that the actual intellectual autonomy that uh, one would like or that this kind of experimentation uh, needs, uh, that's actually very, very limited. Um, anyway, uh, and, you know, we're talking about standardization. One of the uh, one, one of the sub goals of this seminar was to come up with a field guide, 
you know, a, a set of uh, either courses or, um, you know, just, just some ideas that could be put together uh, to make an STS kind of curriculum that people could appeal to. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm putting, we have put that on the back burner because, uh, I mean, a year is a long time over which we've been thinking about this. But nevertheless, uh, I think it would be very useful uh, if the different practitioners could put together something which would guide others who uh, need to be able to, you know, appeal to some, uh, you know, not exactly standards, but at least some framework within which it could be incorporated in different universities in our country. Uh, but that's, that's a project for later. Uh, I just wanted to wind up this morning session uh, because we have a one hour lunch break now and uh, an hour is both short and long. Uh, so, if, you know, we need to come back by two o'clock for sure, a few minutes before two. Uh, so let's just take, let's take a break now and let me close this session by thanking all of you who have spoken, all of you who have contributed uh, questions. Uh, what we've, we've also done is to, to record this entire thing and it'll come up on YouTube uh, later on. So uh, thank you, Dhruv. Thank you, Madhumita. Thank you, Vasundhara, Sanil, um, and, and everybody. Thank you for, for the morning session. We'll come back in the afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.